and four-wheel drive, power steering, and you got the idea. He loved to weld. He rode Seneca and horseshoes. And his quail block stands came with a quail on top of the stand. When we had calves, he braided the halters himself from rope by looking in a book that showed how to do it. I did not get these skills. He could fix almost anything. We never called a repairman. And if he couldn't do it, he called his friends who had those skills. When I was a kid, we didn't have super glue. We had epoxy. He said I would bring my broken toys and say, Poxy Daddy? He was always a hard worker, starting with a paper route as a kid and then cowboying weekends. And he wasn't a quitter. When college didn't work the first time, he did it again, getting his PhD in biochemistry. And for his thesis, for his master's, he built a heart lung perfusion machine to perfuse the liver he was experimenting on. At home in the evenings, in his shop, fixing or building, or doing car maintenance and major repairs. Money was tight. He patched his boots till they looked like a quilt. He was good at making friends. A foreign stu student from New Zealand and his wife became lifelong friends. Gilbert, Go Gilbert Goy, a Navajo student, lifetime friend. Students from Ecuador and strangers in airports. I think going to Brazil for work was a high point. He even learned some Portuguese and we made more friends while he was there. I was jealous when he went to the World Veterinary Conference in Australia and didn't take me. He loved his dogs, Gumdrop, known as Gunshot on Rounds Ups. Ruffin, Bumper, Tippy, and even Musky. I never understood how our dogs were always the best dogs in the world until I finally figured out that everybody's dogs are the best of them. But we sure loved ours. He loved his family. He thanked me for having kids. He loved rocks. His front yard is filled with beautiful rocks collected from everywhere he went that he could bring home a rock. He taught himself leather tooling he made shafts, and saddle rigging, belts, knife sheaths, and purses. He was a good guy. He won a stock trailer by guessing the number of vaccine bottles in a box in a contest. But it wasn't a guess. There was scientific calculation involved. And he donated it to the College of Agriculture. He wrote thank you notes to everyone. He was injured. I guess running at the U of A and went to one of the trainers and they did something. So he wrote a thank you note to the company that had donated whatever it was. And they sent a few more boxes or crates or something. He helped me write this eulogy. He taught me how to proof and rewrite. When I took English in college, mom read the papers for grammar and spelling. Dad went through them with scissors and cut them apart and rearranged them for coherence. <laughs> Every paper went through two or three drafts, and we got a B. <laughs> Growing up, he dug out my splinters and stickers with his pocket knife. We hunted in cowboy together. I was his only son. <laughs> he showed the patience of Job teaching me to drive a clutch. And he always had a funny story at dinner. That meant a lot. In the end, I believe he left a legacy of love. He helped me so much. Major repairs after wrecks to my car, twice. I was always losing things like my pocket knife and retainers. He helped me search. I lost a carved turquoise stone from his arrowhead collection. I think he forgave me for that. Forgave my teenage lies. He always took pride in my accomplishments. The dementia sucked. He had no get up and go. He didn't complain. He was still kind. And for about the last two or three years, if I said goodbye, if I said it was good to see you, he replied every single time. Better 
to be seen than viewed. <laughs> and since he was cremated, that wasn't an issue. But I thought about it. How would they get the cowboy hat in the coffin? It didn't work. But he had to go. I had to give him a pedicure. And for a man who had done his own toenails with a pocket knife his whole life, that had to be the pits. So it was time. And he was considering. He went on a Sunday when everybody was available. And during the day, not the middle of the night, and after Thanksgiving, so it wasn't spoiled. I hope he knew how much I loved him. affectionately 
dubbed him Grandpappy, which he loved. And he never missed an opportunity to say how lucky he was to have his family. Jamie touched on the dog thing, which we decided we would both leave in our talk, but because it was so relevant. Because his relationship with dogs, the dogs that he had over the years, was awesome. It was amazing. And kind of like she said, we were so lucky to always have the best and smartest dogs. And they always loved him the most. They were the family dog, but you know, if dad said, get over here or do this or that, boom, that dog did it. And I know, I just know that they all were wagging their tails, eager to greet him in heaven. Dad had a strong love and appreciation for nature in general, but also for the unique beauty of the desert. He would always comment on trees or shrubs that were in bloom. Even as his memory faded, he continued to notice the mountains, plants, and sunsets. And he did have a ton of sayings, and apparently I used some of them too. The girls used to tease me and say, oh, you and your sayings. So I'll finish with one of my favorites. On a beautiful day, Dad would say, this sure is a bluebird day. And if it were a really beautiful day, he would say, it's a double bluebird day. So I'm grateful to have a lifetime of special memories with the best dad that a girl could have, and I just thank you for all being here today. The uh, next speaker was going to be uh, Shirley Schieber, but I'd like to invite Frank and Pat's two granddaughters, Leah and Andrea, to come up and speak.
regional director in the years of game and fish department. The next one comes from a couple of educators who are close friends of the family. We are so sorry to hear about Frank. I know that you and he shared some very memorable life experiences and that you were very close to him. He was truly a great man who made such a positive difference in the world. In the world. Men like Frank are those who our world really needs right now. This is a week old. And it's comforting to know that he developed a great number of students who will carry on those values so, so important to us all. May you rest in peace and always be watching over you and your family. God bless you. Now, I'm going to share an old 56 Chevy pickup stories. But I'm going to tell you who Frank was to me. Frank was my best friend, mentor, counselor, confidant, and hunting partner for 50 years. And yes, I started with that when I was two. And we, we, shared, we shared so many days together, enjoying God's creation as we, as we hunted antelope, elk, coast whitetail, mule deer, we had, had the opportunity, as was mentioned earlier, to share his last elk hunt. And it was a very memorable hunt. John by Lena and I uh, were both there. It was a great day. John and I got Frank set up in a meadow. He pictured this. He's got a rifle lying over a dead juniper tree sitting there. John and I took off on it. But I think at the time, John thought it was a crazy deal. <laughs> We, we took a long walk and we looped around, and lo and behold, it worked. We heard boom, boom. You obey, you obey. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there's Frank Whiting in the middle of this this meadow with this big old bull elk, and uh, we spent the rest of that day. It was the rest of that day getting the thing broken down and hung in a juniper tree. It was late in the day. We hiked out to. Hiked out to the truck. Then the real fun began the next morning. We woke up and there was a lot of snow. <laughs> John, I hope you don't flinch at this story, but uh, as I remember, we went, out, we, had, me, we went back to retrieve the meat that was hung in the juniper tree. And it was there when we finally, it was all there as we finally got there. I think it took four or five hours for that whole process of and uh, I wish we could have had a film of Johnny B driving Frank's four-wheel drive Dodge with chains on all four tires in an unbelievable place. It was covered with snow. You couldn't see where the trail was. And I do mean trail. Where he did some bam, bam, clang, clang. <laughs> Frank's just like this. <laughs> if you know him well, you can picture it. He was shriveling up because that was his baby that was banging and clang. <laughs> Anyway, we made it back, and John's driving skills made it, made it a good day because he got us back unscathed. The next day at camp, we butchered the meat, wrapped it, in the most sanitary conditions we could find on the back of the, uh, on the tailgate in Trent Frank's truck. <laughs> True story. We had so many good times together hunting, and I mentioned hunting because Frank and I spent a lot of time, a lot of days hunting, and they were all memorable. Yesterday, my hunting partner, John Jackson, who's here with me today, he and I hunted Coast Whitetail in a rugged place where Frank and I and Larry Phillips had the good fortune to take many bucks. Up at 4 a.m., headlamp on, well, this is after a quick breakfast, and headlamp on, stumbling up the canyon, climbing the mountain, huffing and puffing. Frank and I did that so many times on those trails together that I couldn't count them really. Something Frank, Frank and I did many times, I'm sorry. Anyway, I had just reached my appointed spot on a big oak tree. I was soaked in sweat, it was still only 6.30 in the morning. And uh, I put my pack down, <clears throat> pulled out my, my uh, tripod, but, Tripod, started looking around to see what I could see. We 
Uchiko. It's cloudy, so it's a late morning, about 7 o'clock. I see this really beautiful, I mean beautiful, big Kuzuai Tempa. It was uh, something that frankly I'd seen on the same mountain a number of times. This book was on his way to do something. He didn't see me. I ranged him at 502 yards. He didn't know I was there. I didn't, I, I chose not to take a shot. And I could hear Frank in, my, in the back of my mind, God, Bill, hurry up. Hurry up, you can take it. And that was exactly what he would have said. Instead, I watched something. I watched the animal through the binoculars. He was a beauty. And as he topped that ridge, it, I can't explain this, and I don't want to. I'm not going to say that the clouds parted, but there was a little patch of sunlight that came through. The sun wasn't all the way up, but there was light on this book. And the other thing that struck me just before that was this book's walking through, walking through an area that, oh, I don't know, three foot, two, high, two feet, three feet high, and it was quite a ways off, so I couldn't tell you, but were white flowers. I'm sure it had already frozen there a handful of times. And so dry, I don't know where they got the moisture to grow. But here's this deer walking through these flowers. Small break in the clouds, a little bit of light came down on just that patch, and this is a true story. He paused for a moment, turned slightly sideways, and looked back out over the basin where I was sitting. He didn't know I was there, I was way down at the bottom of it. He turned around, flicked his tail a little bit, and walked over the ridge. He said goodbye. He calmly disappeared.
Frank was the only reason I made it through school. <coughs> Kate continued improving his skills using the knowledge shared by Frank and very, success is very successfully selling cheese all over the world, including at Trader Joe's. Dr. Whiting took us on many hands-on field trips to the Beeb RV in Northern Arizona and the World Dairy Expo in Madison, Wisconsin. I have no better memories than watching him work with the animals and how at home he was teaching. Everyone wanted to visit with him, and many of us skipped class numerous times. Just to finish a story or hear a teaching moment. I will certainly always remember there being a line to get into his office at any time of the day. I was like a sponge when he spoke, just like many others. I will always remember his retirement party in the chance building of the animal science department with his cake showing him riding off into the sunset. We stayed in contact over the years, and I will cherish all those times together, our lunches, our many adventures and phone calls. I have been forever grateful that he thought highly enough of me to nominate me for a U of A Early Achiever Award in 2007, long after his retirement. I will always remember our last lunch we had together a few months back, holding your hand all the way back home. Then, as we always did when dropping him off, we exchanged I love yous like we did before parting ways and saying goodbye. I will always miss you and love you, Frank. We know you are up in heaven riding one of your favorite horses, Pete or Leroy, and having your beloved canine friend, Tibby, at your side. Ride, brand, and do leather work like someone left the pasture gates open. There are few, if any, like you. Over the last week, I've heard so many great stories from others who Frank touched their hearts and lives just like he had mine. As Steve Faber, past New Bay Dairy Manager and my favorite boss, told me so eloquently, you as a person were treated as he did his best cowboy hat, with care, respect, on a high place, made just to fit as you deserved. To be gotten again as you were last, with nowhere, no tear, and glad to be at hand. I will leave you with the final words from my friend and college classmate Jason Sohenfelder, who Frank insisted he call him Poncho. Frank was a legend, and we all say right on, Dr. Poncho. In Frank's last part of his life, it was really hard to watch him go down. And he did so with grace and dignity. And I remember um, as he came to the end of his life, there is a Welsh poet that I really really love, and his name is Dylan Thomas. Towards the end of the poem, one of the poems he wrote, and I thought of this when Frank died, it ends with, I said some words to the close and holy darkness, and then I slept. So I would encourage you, the family, and grandchildren, anyone else you can think of, to pass those memories and stories of Frank down. Absolutely down. Keep those stories alive. Keep Frank's spirit alive because he really was an amazing man. So Frank and I shared one other thing in common. That was long and skinny feet. So Frank came by and handed these to me one day, this pair of boots, and I can't tell you how touched I was. So I saw them in my closet a couple of days ago and I teared up because it reminded me, these boots reminded me of a great man who shelled the shoes I was never going to fill when 
mean, I, I, I wish I could even be a fraction of man that Frank was. And so, um, I will always remember the guy who wore these, but especially I will remember Frank with love and a smile on his face because he made this world a better place. Jesus said to them, come. 
to have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Frank fed just about everybody he came in contact with. And I think those words are wonderfully special because they are the first time in 42 years of ministry I've ever read them in the memorial service, but they seem to fit Frank so perfectly. Both you and Frank. I invite you to hear these words from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Just before I came in, I was standing beside Linda and I leaned over and I said, now, Linda, I'm not going to say a lot today. It's just going to be really brief. I said, it's a long afternoon for this family. I know you're tired. You've been through a lot. And she said to me, she said, you mean you're not going to preach a Baptist sermon? And I said to her, I said to her, if there is anyone in this world who we do not need to preach into heaven, it's Frank White. And I meant every word of it. I, want to, I will take a moment and tell you one quick little personal story. Since everybody's told the story, I'll tell a quick one. I've been wanting to speak to Frank about his life ever since I just talked to him briefly because he was he came in every week into the office where he and Pat, Pat volunteered Frank with, with her. And I wanted to talk to him. The only chance I really got to talk to him at any length and learn about his life was just before he was about to have surgery. And I spoke to him, and I heard some of those stories that you've heard, or you know. And I went back home, because I'm an Eastern dude, and I said to my wife, I have finally met a true, authentic cowboy. The first I've ever met. And Amy said to me, well, you know, why do you say that? What makes him a cowboy? And I said, the man got thrown off the horse, he broke his neck, he stood up, dusted himself off, and went home. And he said, that's the most cowboy thing I've ever heard in my life. And I, and I said, you, you say you did. I said, you just don't get more cowboy than that. Words of hope. We've sung some beautiful hymns, but there's one hymn we haven't sung that begins with these words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. You see, Frank knew where to stand in his life, and he would counsel us today to stand where he stood, upon the solid rock of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Life is filled with sinking sand. You'll find it in the desert, on ranches. And you also find it in the places and people or the things that simply cannot hold up. 
nor hold us up in our times of need. But Christ did not fail Frank in life or in death. And that is why we celebrate that great hope that dwells in the hearts of all believers. For what becomes dead to the world is always alive to us and always present to us through the Holy Spirit. Pat, for you, for you, Frank's daughters and the families, I want to assure you that he will still be present to you in the time ahead. You will hear his voice. You will feel his encouragement. You'll hear his counsel. He will speak to your hearts and you will feel his love around you. I promise you that. When someone like Frank goes home to be with God, he takes a piece of us with him. And he will be missed, not just by you, but by his community, by his friends, and by this church. But rest assured that the greatest part of Frank Biden resides in you. As we now bear his presence into the world. And I know, as you already did, you will make him proud with your lives. Frank loved his Lord and Savior. And as we stand on the cusp of Christmas, Frank's death reminds us of why Christ was born, why he taught, why he healed, why he forgave sins, and why he went to the cross so that death would not have the final say. I pray that in this Christmas season, when we celebrate the birth of our Lord, you as Frank's beloved, will also celebrate our brother's resurrection to his new life. Winter does not have the final say. Spring comes. And life begins again. May Frank rest in peace. And may our hearts be at peace as well. For spring is coming. We shall see him again. I invite you to join me in a brief affirmation of faith, which you'll find in your bulletin. It's just a way of us to say with Frank what we believe. Would you join me, please, as we read this together in use? We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers and protects and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints, called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. As we come to our time of prayer, we uh, would remember and let you know that Frank served two terms as a deacon here at the Presbyterian Church uh, for six years. He also served as an elder for two terms for six years. Uh, and so, because he was an elder and he will be on the honor roll uh, of those who have passed in that respect. Let us pray. Lord God, how, how do we truly eulogize and remember a man like Frank? We, we don't in some ways and, and in other ways we we have gathered here and it's this large body of people that pay tribute today to this humble, caring man. We thank you, O oh God, for his life, for his marriage with Pat, for their life together, for the family that they have created. 
We ask you, O oh God, that your mercy be with the family in the days to come. That is when we often grieve the most, months ahead, years ahead. We thank you, O oh Lord, for allowing us to know this your servant. And so, Lord, into your hands, O oh, most merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Frank. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold and a lamb of your own flock. Receive him into the arms of mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Holy God, by your creative power, you gave us life. And in your redeeming love, you have given us new life in Christ. We commend your child, Frank, to your merciful care. In the faith of Christ our Lord, who died and rose again to save us, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And Lord, it is in your Son's name that we pray together the prayer he taught us in unison, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Folks, I would invite him, we invite you who are able to please stand as we sing together verse 1, 2, and 4 of how great thou art.
you all so much for coming today. And so on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Sigmund, and myself, we are so grateful you came out. There are refreshments in the back. Have a chance to greet the family. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and to be gracious to you now and forevermore. Amen.